I am very honored to be here. I want to thank Randy for um, uh, inviting me and the um, conversations that he and I have had over the past months um, preparing for this visit uh, have been really illuminating um, about the program that he runs here. I had a wonderful day um, touring around the campus and seeing the beautiful campus you all um, get to learn and teach and live in and a wonderful visit with uh, President Nolan um, as well. And um, it's really an honor to be here and to have such a turnout at, at this event. I, I hope that many of you have had a chance to see some of the films that I've made. Um, and I just want to make sure you yeah, look at this up. Um, I have had the privilege to really address some of the nation's most difficult issues that individuals and families face. Um, and uh, it's been a very interesting career so far, um, trying to conquer such complicated issues as HIV transmission, as teenage smoking, uh, addiction, Alzheimer's disease, and finally obesity. So I'm gonna spend the evening talking about uh, my experience addressing those issues, but I, I wanna start by showing you a film which really characterizes the work that I'm trying to do now and what I have um, set out to do with the Institute of Medicine, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences. And this is the nation, if not the world's, most important deliberative body on um, health and, and medical issues. But I, I'm going to show you a video which will give you a sense of, of the real serious health issues that we face as a nation. So get the lights to come up. This, this video represents the sort of culmination of my work um, in public health. It is, it's a moment in time right now where I'm trying to take the experience that I've gathered as a filmmaker and as someone who has been given the task of trying to uh, communicate about very complicated subjects to the public in a way that they will not only understand, but hopefully be motivated to make the kinds of changes in their lives and work to make the kind of changes in their communities that it's going to take if we're really going to address the increasing burden of chronic disease in this country. So when Randy um, heard about this work and, um, uh, and this new direction in, in my career to really launch a healthy America, um, he asked me to come and, and talk about that and thought it'd be important to help you in, in talking about a healthy America to set the stage a little bit and how I um, got to this point and really how I have learned to use um, these very powerful um, communication tools that we have. The power of television still is uh, incredible in this country and we all know about the explosion of social media and now we have, I have even more tools to work with, so I have to learn how to use and harness the full power of social media in addition to what I can do with television. Um, I'm also learning about the power of marketing. Um, a Healthy America, and I'll get to this later, Healthy America is very much of a marketing campaign and this notion of marketing health in this country and have we really ever made this a priority in the multitude of messages that um, people receive every day in, in, from marketing. So um, I'm not a journalist. I think it's very important that I have you all understand that um, I, I see my role as, as someone who tries to find the most powerful and effective way to use this technology to communicate. Um, I work with scientists to help them try to convey their knowledge, um, but uh, the work of journalism is, is somewhat different. Um, and the role of journalism to really ask and, and be another dimension of society to, to pose and challenge and, 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 and investigate um, is very different. Um, I, I see my role as to really shape pieces of communication. So um, going back and, and sort of in time to help you understand who I am and how I got to this place, and again, I will tell you more about A Healthy America. Um, I graduated from college with a degree in biochemistry, 
with no interest in doing that in my life. I had no idea what I would do with that degree. And the last month that I was in college, I made a film for an anthropology course. Um, and I met today with some of the film and television students, and we talked about that. I don't know if some of them are here t tonight. Um, but that, I took that film with me to New York, um, uh, the city I knew that I would always uh, want to live in. And I did whatever I could um, to start learning about the craft of filmmaking, uh, doing internships, training programs, whatever I could. Um, and it, it wasn't long before I was working on a, on a documentary, um, helping to produce it, when uh, one of the people, the, one of the assistant editors, um, became sick and died of AIDS. Um, and that was my first experience of, of knowing somebody who got sick, um, not only got sick, but then died very quickly from HIV and AIDS. And at this man's funeral, his partner said, you know, don't give, you know, don't give money, do something. You know, I want, can, everybody has to do something. This was in 1984. Um, and so I thought, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to, you know, learn about this crap, that's what I will do. I will communicate about HIV transmission, and I'll try to help stop the spread of AIDS by helping to inform people about this terrible um, disease, this growing epidemic. So um, I had a huge lesson in um, taking on this issue. I, had, I was 25 years old, and I uh, soon partnered with another filmmaker who was more senior than me, and we were introduced to a research psychologist at Columbia University. Um, and together we formed a nonprofit company called AIDS Films. Um, and the goal was, and we thought that we would have so much competition that everybody would be racing to, to, uh, to you know, produce all this kind of HIV prevention material, and nobody was doing anything. Um, and so we started raising money successfully from the foundation world. Um, and it wasn't long before we got a, an important grant from the Ford Foundation um, for a film that um, became the first film broadcast nationally in this country um, to inform um, primarily straight uh, men and women about the increasing dangers and risks of HIV transmission not only in gay men and IV drug users, but how this is a virus that um, does not discriminate and that increasingly men and women would have to understand the same issues around safe sex that gay men were really at that point um, quite keenly aware of. So I'm gonna show you a clip from that film and I'll tell you a few stories about it. So remember this is 19, this aired in 1987. If you're not gay and you're not an IV drug user, why should you watch a movie about AIDS? Why should you care? I have AIDS. I have AIDS. I have AIDS. I have AIDS. Baby has AIDS. Which is not to say that AIDS isn't still devastating the gay community or taking the lives of IV drug users. It is. But they're already making changes in how they live. They know they're in danger. This film will tell you what AIDS is, how you get it, and how you avoid getting it. We'll tell you what the doctors know for sure and what they're still unclear about. When this film is over, you'll know what you need to do so that you won't get AIDS. I lived with Jack, and then we got married because I wanted to have a baby. And I got pregnant right away. That's what we got in trouble was when I got sick. But I was losing weight, coughing, throwing up. 
they couldn't figure it out. And then they told me that I had AIDS. So what happened with this film um, is this, I have to tell this story about when this film debuted. This is 1987. Um, the issue of HIV is, um, you know, on many people's minds, it's very controversial. Um, we got the president's son to um, host this film, um, which was uh, highly unusual. He was speaking out in a way that his father Ray, President Reagan had never addressed the issue of HIV. Um, and this was broadcast on PBS across the nation, prime time. Um, and in the film, Ruben Bodas, who's a, a, a Latin uh, music star, um, does a condom demonstration on a banana. It's the first time a condom was shown outside of a wrapper um, and on national television in this country. And so he, we, it was very important that people understand that this is the most effective tool that we have against the spread of HIV and that people need to know the proper use of a condom. And so we used a banana. So one week before the film is to premiere, PBS announces the film, puts out press releases, and um, it's being written about, actually about two weeks before, and I get a letter, I come to work, and I get a letter from the president of the International Banana Growers Association <laughs> threatening us with an injunction <clears throat> against the film because we are defaming the banana. <clears throat> but the first line of the letter said, bananas penetrate 99% of American households. <laughs> And you look at this, and you go, this is gold. <laughs> so we hired a publicist, and Johnny Carson read the letter on the air. NPR read the entire letter on the air. And needless to say, the film went on the air, and I would, didn't get sued by the International Banana Growers Association. And I learned a lot of lessons about how you can build some things into films to gather a lot of attention. But the more important lesson I learned in doing AIDS change in the rules um, was the importance of operating from an evidence base. If you're going to communicate about health information, you have to have an evidence base. The importance of working with academic institutions um, and building um, alliances with acad academic institutions. The importance of having a dissemination model um, of distributing your content to the communities that are most in need of receiving it. That television is a wonderful, it's, a, it's still in today, it was obviously then, but it still is today, the most powerful way of galvanizing the nation's attention. Um, and that using that medium to build awareness and then supplementing that with the distribution of content to community-based organizations who will use these films, films like this, as tools. So that was a, a, a lot to learn. I was, again, this was my first endeavor. It was setting up a nonprofit company. Um, it was learning about running a small media company. And um, I went on, AIDS Films went on to do a lot more HIV prevention films for targeted population, a lot of films for women, a lot of films for the black and Latino communities. Um, and I also um, learned a lot of lessons about using evidence-based, it's not all, only evidence-based science in terms of the science of a disease like HIV, but it's the evidence base about effective means of communicating issues. In the film, It's Changing the Rules, there are a lot of scenes in which people negotiate a safe sex discussion. They were actors, it was a script, um, and the, in those scenes where we use actors, they are women as co-workers discussing safe sex and going out on a date and whether they can bring up the issue or not. That's modeling that you need to destigmatize some of these issues if you really are going to talk about such, such serious issues. 
we, neg we model the couple who are clearly having a wonderful evening together and the discussion about where is this evening going to go and modeling a woman bringing up the issue of condom use and her overcoming her fears. And the science behind that is that if you are watching that behavior being modeled by someone else and you're, that neural pathway is being laid down and then in a community setting that is being talked about and you're asking people to talk about their own experience, you're, you're digging, not you're digging, you're creating an even stronger, stronger neural pathway so that when the person encounters that kind of negotiation in real life, they are that much more prepared. And so there's an evidence base, the research a lot from heart disease prevention in terms of uh, in, that, in, in, in that time in the 1980s, there was a body of evidence people who are really working in heart disease prevention to try to help people really engage in a healthier diet, a lower cholesterol diet. And there's tremendous obstacles that people have to change their diet, and really cultural obstacles. So that's the, that was the evidence that we were able to put forth as the reason for modeling those kind of behavior changes. So that was then. I'm going to skip forward. I, I had the great privilege of developing some children's series for Nickelodeon and for HBO. Um, uh, and I was asked by HBO to um, come and make a show called Smoke Alarm. This was a show that was uh, targeted towards teenagers and dealing with tobacco, smokeless, and cigarettes, and um, using every kind of technique to help adolescents really understand the dangers of, of tobacco and all the techniques that the tobacco industry engages in to try to um, really find a new generation of customers. So um, when I finished working on Smoke Alarm, I was uh, asked by Sheila Evans, who created HBO's documentary department, um, to take on the issue of addiction. And the reason was that Sheila's son, um, this is something that is, she has spoken about publicly, so I'm not betraying any confidence of hers. Sheila's son was, she, Sheila as a mother was dealing with a son uh, who was in his early 20s and um, really having um, a lot of trouble with drug and alcohol addiction. And here uh, we are in New York. Here's a woman who uh, is a hugely powerful television executive working for Time Warner, which is the largest entertainment company in the world. Um, with access to any doctor in the world if she wants it. Money is no object. And she cannot, she feels that she's going to lose her son. She's convinced that her son is going to die. And what can she do? And if she's saying, if I have this trouble, if I don't know where to turn for answers, I don't know who, you know, when I'm talking to a doctor, is this approach the right approach? Is that approach? Is this treatment program effective? What do I ask? What do I need to know? And, her question is, why can't he just stop? Um, she said, we have to use the power of this platform that we have to try to help people who don't have the kind of access we have. If, we, if we're struggling, others are struggling even more, let's do something about it. So that led to a, um, a partnership with the National Institutes of Health. Um, working with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and it resulted in a series called Addiction. Um, it has, I have a little show and tell here. I don't have a clip from Addiction to show you, but um, we were able to produce um, a, a tremendous amount of materials and a companion book that uh, through the generosity of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest public health foundation in the country, um, we were able to distribute this to thousands and thousands of community-based organizations. Um, and this is a series that, I, you know, if, if any of you are working in this area, if you're working with, in drug and alcohol treatment, if you have a family member who is struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, this is I would say that addiction was really made for the family who is trying to understand what is happening in the, with the addict. What is happening in the addict's brain um, and what are the changes that are going on. And um, 
I've, I've made this comment earlier. This is, this is the hardest film I've ever done. I've told you about taking on HIV, and you know that I've dealt with Alzheimer's and obesity. But I would say that this topic was the most difficult science and the most difficult um, uh, sort of um, on an emotional level to try to wrestle this issue to the ground. And um, we've been talking throughout the day, Randy and myself, and the conversations with others, that um, you know, we have this exploding problem of prescription pain medication abuse in this country. It's only getting worse. And um, we've, we really have to figure out ways to conquer this exploding addiction problem. And I know that it's affecting every community. It's probably affecting yours. It's affecting every community in the country. Um, so this is a tool which I think is still very valuable. This aired in 2007. And when this was done, um, I was asked to take on uh, the issue of Alzheimer's. And um, my father died of Alzheimer's <clears throat> when he died um, in 19, um, trying to remember who was, he died 15, 14 years ago, so whenever that was. Um, Sheila asked me if I would do something on Alzheimer's, and I said, no way. Um, but when we finished um, addiction, I went to the uh, NIH and the head of the NIH, and I said, um, you know, we had this fantastic experience. Addiction won the uh, Governor's Award from the Emmys. Um, they were very proud, the NIH, to have their own Emmy, um, the Governor's Award. I was very proud to um, help them receive it and help HBO receive it. It's the highest honor from the Emmys. Um, I said, where is their hope? You know, the, with addiction, we were, the reason to do it is that, there, that science is really uncovering effective ways of uh, it intervening with different forms of addiction. Not all, but there are advances. So where else is there advances in the issues that are affecting many American families? And they said, please do Alzheimer's. Um, that we feel that um, they're really, we do now have enough body of evidence to communicate to the public that there are things you can do in midlife to really mitigate your chances of developing Alzheimer's in late life. And Alzheimer's is the second most feared illness uh, in this country next to cancer. No one wants to lose their mind. Um, and so the NIH um, have been really looking at these issue, these, this question of lifestyle and are, is there a connection between lifestyle and the development of dementia and Alzheimer's? And they had enough evidence to say that as I said, there are things you can do, that there is hope um, to really reduce your chances of developing Alzheimer's. So I'm going to show you a clip from um, what became the project called the Alzheimer's Project, and I hope this one plays. But now we don't have audio. So the Alzheimer's Project was meant to move us from hopelessness to hope. So this is a, uh, a, a DVD kit. There's a companion book as well. Um, this, Maria Shriver is the executive producer, was the executive producer of the Alzheimer's Project. Um, it was the challenge of really conveying some very, very complicated um, neuroscience to the public to help them understand that there are doctors and researchers in this country who are really dedicating their lives. And the way I like to say it is that these are people who are using their mind to save our brains. That it's, we have an amazing institution in this country, the NIH, that is the largest funder of medical research in the world. Um, and I, it is an incredibly important thing. It was very important for me to communicate to the public that it's only through investment in basic science, and I'm sure as an academic institution that you, can, you all can relate, but it's only through the support of that kind of research that we are going to, that we can get to the point of having hope for something which for so long was seen as something which was completely uh, sort of impenetrable as a disease. Um, and there's just been tremendous advances in, in the basic science. <laughs> so 
this was a, the addiction took me three years to make, and this show, um, The Alzheimer's Project, was two years of my life. Um, and then, when that finished, everybody, uh, we had established, I had established a, sort of a, a, a look and a feel and a sense of momentum in getting these pieces, this, this kind of content out to the country. And <clears throat> the signal coming from all sides was that we have to deal with obesity. Please do obesity. Please do obesity, because this is the real exploding public health crisis in the country. And so um, many of you may have come to know The Way to the Nation. This is a series that premiered in May of 2012 on HBO. Um, it was a co-production of HBO, the Institute of Medicine, the NIH, the CDC, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, and Kaiser Permanente. Uh, which is a healthcare provider. Um, and I'll show you, let me show you a clip from that. Hopefully that one will play. I don't want to be fat for the rest of my life. My struggles, my weight, all that. They call me fat and ugly. I'm very sad about that. There's hardly any part of your body that it doesn't harm. You got me to do this. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm worried about not being able to live as long as I could because of my weight. All of us have to be part of the solution. We have got to come together as a country and really make this a priority. The way the nation is out of control, but we can fix that. The experience of doing The Way to the Nation was very different for me um, than what I did on uh, addiction or Alzheimer's. I, my job was to really find ways to communicate complicated science with uh, addiction and Alzheimer's. Um, but it became quickly apparent in, in taking on the issue of obesity that the hope is not going to, it's probably not going to come from the laboratory. Uh, the laboratory has to be part of the solution, but it's not, it's not where the answer is going to be found. Um, that the level of, uh, of change that has to happen in society, if we're really going to um, wrestle this problem of obesity to the ground, um, is, uh, is, is just enormous in ways that are almost immeasurable, um, and it has to come from an entirely systemic approach. And this was the great lesson for me in, in investing as much time as I was able to invest in understanding the issues of obesity. Um, it taught me a lot about public health, which is what led to the discussions with Randy um, and why I'm here tonight with you. Um, the issues of addiction and Alzheimer's, um, tobacco, HIV, um, these are public health tremendous public health issues. But obesity um, is a, a public health issue that it really will require the involvement of the government at the highest levels and the individual and the decisions that are made in the home and, and made by the individual every day. So it's a, it really is an issue of personal responsibility and the choices we make in an environment that is all too often really making the hard choice and making the easy choice too hard. And so how can, you know, I had to really confront and really learn about um, the myriad of issues that are really making this a, a terrible challenge for people day to day and a challenge for a healthcare system that really is unprepared for the, the, the tsunami the absolute tsunami of uh, chronic disease that is coming our way as a result of two-thirds of Americans being overweight or obese. So I became convinced that I was at a point um, in, in my career 
Um, I had developed relationships with the Institute of Medicine, the NIH, and the CDC. And that the problems of obesity and chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, um, that these leading killers in this country, um, these chronic diseases are what is um, causing disease and death in the vast majority of, of Americans. That an event like the weight of the nation is, is not enough. Um, we, we, to, if we really are going to um, change the way that we live, we really are going to create a culture of health in, this, in America, we need to really leverage many, many sectors of American society. But I can try to use my skills and my, the momentum that I have to try to leverage the power of the media at a level that has really not been tried, to try to create a campaign and a movement in this country, to inspire a movement in all levels, starting with youth and going all the way up through the retired, to really saturate people's media experiences with messages about chronic disease and about what it's going to take and what people have to do to really change, as I say, their lives and really work to change the communities we all live in so that we are really moving in the direction where we are much more health promoting. So that is what I in, o opened with, with A Healthy America. Um, and I'm just going to take you through some slides that will give you a sense of the scope of the problem that we're dealing with. All right, another piece of equipment that's, okay. So America is not healthy. And I believe that it can be. And these are some of the statistics about how unhealthy we are as a nation. This is a fact that is getting a lot of attention these days. In the history of mankind, other than through famine and war, we have not reversed life expectancy. So under our watch, children born today will most likely have shorter lives than their parents. Yet we are living in an age of the greatest advances in science and medicine and known to man with only a feeling of great horizons ahead of us. So how can it be that in an era of such scientific advancement that we are going to reverse life expectancy? And I, I, I find something like this just, just unacceptable. It feels morally unacceptable that we can allow this to happen as a nation. So heart disease is still the number one killer. Sometimes we don't think about these diseases um, as much as we should. It's very important, this notion of these being preventable chronic diseases. So the costs of this disease burden, this chronic disease burden, are believed to be already unsustainable. And as I said earlier, with the, the tsunami of chronic disease that is going to be added to the healthcare system, every economist is predicting that our healthcare system will crumble. It will not be able to sustain this, this amount of disease treatment. Now, Combined with all of this disease, we have a terrible problem of what's a term that's called health illiteracy. So five out of 10 Americans really have tremendous problems understanding 
the most basic information about health and health care, their own health, the health of their children. In an IOM report, it leads about health literacy. It leads off with a story of a well-educated woman whose daughter has an ear infection. She's given a prescription for medicine for her daughter's ear infection. She goes to the pharmacy, gets the prescription filled, comes home with the syrup, serum, open, reads the prescription, opens the bottle, and pours the medicine into her daughter's ear. It's an oral medication for an ear infection, but she doesn't understand the prescriptions. So people are having tremendous difficulty with understanding the most basic information about that they're getting from their doctors, that they're reading in their local papers. So when I came to understand that we have this tremendous disease burden combined with a tremendous problem of health literacy in this country, that this is only making the problem that much more dire and the need for inter intervention that much more serious. So that led me to go to the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, and to the NIH and start working on how we can use the media to change the discussion. And these are the values, these are the goals that we believe we should really be aspiring to. So there's a continuum of knowledge, attitudes, values, and behaviors about health that we need to intervene on. And we need to provide people, we need to provide the health providers in this country, the educators, the employers, the churches. We need to provide a just deluge of content, to have a ubiquity of content that is health promoting and is trying to raise the health literacy of this country. This is who I am. This is my new company. The Institute of Medicine, as I mentioned, is part of the National Academy of Sciences. <coughs> Sorry. Number two. We want to raise the nation's health literacy. We want to create a pervasive culture of health in America. And in 2015, we want to bring a healthy America to the American public. So it's an audacious goal um, to try to change these conversations in this country. Um, we are working with some of the nation's leading healthcare providers. We're working with some of the nation's leading Corporate, most important corporate leaders. We're trying to create a mighty coalition from all sectors, from academic institutions like yours, from the leading hospitals in this country, from the leading research institutions throughout this country. We want to galvanize the largest employers in this country to use their wellness programs to really amp up the prevention messages, to really make prevention the absolute most important issue in the workplace in terms of communicating about health. Corporations in this country, I've, I've, I, another story I was telling Randy, we met with Matt Rose, who's the um, chairman and CEO of Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. It's a division of Berkshire Hathaway, which is owned by Warren Buffett. It's a, I think it's a $24 billion corporation, Burlington Northern. So I go down to, San, to Fort Worth, Texas to meet with Matt. And um, he says, you know, I'm on the board of AT&T. I say, OK. He goes, you know, AT&T is not a communications company anymore. It's become a healthcare company. Uh, did you know that? And there's a few of us in the room, and everyone looks at him, you know, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, yeah. Um, healthcare is now the number one cost um, to running AT&T. So it's not a communications company, it's a healthcare company. It's spending all its money taking care of its employees. He says, so if in 2013, AT&T has this spending X billion dollars on healthcare, when healthcare is 20% of the, 18% of the American GDP, 
Healthcare is 9% of Britain's GDP. That's the next lowest in the world. So it goes from 18 to 9. What happens, he says, when healthcare is 20% of the American GDP? What happens when it's 25% of the American GDP? He said AT&T is going to go out of business. It's going to say, the stockholders will say, it's not worth our while. It's too, it's too expensive to take care of our employees. So what we're trying to do with a healthy America is say that to work with these large employers, to work with the healthcare companies that are trying to bring new models of care, all about preventing illness, because the healthcare, and we, whatever we think about Obamacare, its purpose is ultimately to prevent disease. All the economic models about healthcare reform are about how we have to, if we're going to achieve the cost savings that is going to make you know, Obamacare succeed, and whatever we think of it, if it's the next version of it, if that doesn't work and we have the next version, the only way that these healthcare, that our healthcare system is going to be sustainable is if we're preventing this disease and not treating this disease. So what I'm trying to do is say, I'll take the media part. Um, I'll let others um, work in other sectors, but you know, I'm working to try to bring leaders together to say, let's do something we have never done before. Let's do it at a scale we have never tried before um, because we have these communications tools that have never been more powerful. So I'm going to do one more slide deck, and then we'll have Q&A. Um, and I'll give you a sense of what um, it's going to take to get this off the ground. So we propose a hypothetical. So what would happen, imagine in 2040 that you're reading the paper and this was the headline. In a report released today by the CDC, the CDC says that chronic disease rates are at levels last seen in the 20th century. Chronic disease drops to a 40-year low. So I'm saying that's my goal. In my, what I have left in the years of my career, I want to be responsible for that kind of a headline. But what do I have to do to get us there? So over the next two years, we need to understand what is stopping Americans from living the longest lives they can. We need to come into Johnson City. We need to go into San Antonio. We need to listen to people and ask them these, que these kinds of questions. What is stopping you from living the longest life you can? We need to listen to Americans and understand now what are their attitudes and beliefs about their health. What is standing in the way of good health? We need to understand how people of varying ages from across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds with diverse health conditions and in different regions of the country, sorry, think and communicate about health. But we need to work from an evidence base. And we have two campaigns in this country that provide us all the evidence we need. We know that this country can change its culture around important health behaviors. We've changed our culture in a remarkably short time around seatbelt use and tobacco. These are media campaigns that it, we decided to make these two issues of utmost importance in our society. And everybody in this room buckles up. It's an automatic behavior. But media was a crucial part of the story. Now, often when I make, come to this point, if I'm in a smaller group, and some of you might ask it, might be thinking to ask it later, but I'm going to you know, bring it up now, one of the executives who is a part of a healthy America ran the ad council responsible for the crash test dummies. And people often say, well, it, it was the laws. It was the seatbelt laws. You know, without the seatbelt laws, we wouldn't have people using it buckling up. The Highway, National Highway Tra Transportation Safety Board went to the Ad Council and said, we need to change the attitudes 
of Americans about seatbelts because it's polling in the 20s, meaning that only 20% of Americans think they need to buckle up. And no state legislature is going to introduce mandatory seatbelt laws until it's polling, polling at 50%. They're not going to stick their neck out. This is how change happens, and no legislator is going to stick their neck out to say mandatory seatbelt use. So we need you, the Ad Council, to change America's attitudes about seatbelts. So that's the history of the crash test I mean, it's the reason that they were created, and it worked. And within about two years, seatbelt use, receptivity seatbelt use, was polling at over 50%, and mandatory seatbelt laws spread across the nation very quickly. So we have the evidence. There's a black box quality to what I do. There's a black box quality to coming up with crash test dummies. What I mean by that is that creative people have to be given the means and the time to think up innovative ideas like crash test dummies. We need to find people who are great communicators about their own chronic disease or their expertise about chronic disease. We need to saturate the culture. If we're going to do this, we have to reach Americans. We have to have billboards on the highways. We have to have curricula in the schools. We have to have uh, events at the churches. We need to create a mighty coalition. We're going to market the hell out of health, excuse me. We have to be current. We have to be constantly changes. If we want to reach adolescents, we have to be you know, right with them. I don't think we'll ever be ahead of them about what is the platform that they're communicating on. If it's not Facebook and it's you know, whatever it's they've moved on to, we need to be as right there with them. We need to start young because it's so much easier to start a child and, gr and raise a healthy child than to really bring an adult that's struggling with chronic disease to a point of good health and sustained health. Young adults, top priority. I think in an academic institution, you'll understand that we need to always improve and we need to test, measure, adapt, test, measure, adapt, test, measure, adapt. So, Again, it's Healthy America. It's the work that I'm trying to do in the next two years. That is my nonprofit. That is my partner. And this is a Healthy America. So I'm, that is my presentation. I want to you know, engage in a conversation with you. And the, we're never going to be able to compete. We're never going to have a level playing field. You know, it's, um, you're right that we don't have tobacco advertising on television anymore. Um, and we do have a tremendous amount of advertising for sugar-sweetened beverages and for junk food. Um, it's about, I think it's about $5 billion a year um, that is being spent on yeah, the marketing of, of um, snacks and, and sugar-sweetened beverages. I'm not going to... I, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pipe dream to think that I'm going to come even close to that. So we just have to be strategic. Um, that advertising is not going, going to go away. But if we can change the culture so that we can really start by changing the demand for healthier products, if we can really move the culture in, away from the craving of these foods, one, we create 
a market that they're going to advertise. If they're going to be making money on healthier products, they're going to advertise the healthier products. So, and we're not, we're not saying, and we're not calling for a ban on anything. But we're just saying that we have to try to change the palate of the American public. The, my goal with a Healthy America is to ultimately impact chronic disease rates. So I've tried to make that case. So what are the drivers of chronic disease? So the chronic diseases that are killing, as I said, are heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, stroke, vast majority of Americans. There are six factors that create almost, are responsible for almost all that disease. Excess salt, sugar, fat, inactivity, tobacco, and excess alcohol. If you can affect those, any one of those, or any combination of those drivers of chronic disease, you are bending the curve on chronic disease in this country. So that's what we're trying to do. I'm not, I'm not an ad guy. I make long form content, I don't pretend to be an ad guy. So I'm saying let's get the smartest ad people who work for Coke, who work for McDonald's, who work for Xbox. Xbox, what are we doing with Xbox? We're marketing inactivity, okay? So we need to take those brilliant ad minds and apply them to health. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that part of the problem of high obesity and high TIVs in our culture is due to the high carbohydrate consumption within our society. And there, there's a mea culpa coming out of certain segments of the medical profession that some of this has been induced by the profession with a high emphasis of fat as a culprit. Uh, and that may be true of compromised individuals. But I'm wondering if that's reached your radar. That, that, that's been a fallacy in terms of the overall diet, that, that is not necessarily the problem. Maybe in, in, in the individual, that's probably the issues, but is it necessary to substitute all the stress of this kind of which is really feeding back the weight? Right. Well, when we did the Weight of the Nation, um, this issue was discussed by many of the experts that we talked to, that one of the um, real uh, disservices that we did uh, was really advocating um, a overly low fat diet um, and <clears throat> that the removal of fat from so many products led to a spiking of, of the sweetener in those products. So snack wells, for example, it's a fat-free cookie. It didn't taste good unless you put a lot more sugar in there. Um, and so, you know, we've got to you know, that, that I think is a, is a mistake that there's been, I think, a cultural correction against um, uh, to some extent. But overall, Americans have to understand that we're consuming far too much salt, sugar, and fat. You know, in the, the, in the way to the nation, there's a, a sequence where we show these charts of the increase of salt in the diet, the increase of sugar in the diet, the increase of fat in the diet, the increase of inactivity. And they, they're just all the same shape curve. We lay them one on top of the other, the amount of television watching in the country, in, in the culture. And so, you know, these, it's, it's all of these factors. There's no one factor that can be isolated with an issue like obesity. Um, it is a, uh, it's it's a um, it's a it is a I'd like to say that we sort of engineered our way into this problem. It's an unintended consequence of progress. No one thought that when they invented television that the amount of television watching might be a contributor to obesity. No one thought when they invented the microwave that that sort of time-saving device was going to maybe reduce the number of calories that a woman expends or a man expends cooking. But it's those small changes in the caloric balance that over time add up. So there's just been so many of them that we reached a tipping point. And so the vast majority of people in this country have a caloric imbalance. And slowly over time, they're adding pounds. two-part question, actually. Uh, one of the, the first part of the question is, 
uh, is Alzheimer's have a specific age that it starts to set in? And what is the youngest age that you have, you know, run across that Alzheimer's is setting in? So Alzheimer's is actually, it's almost like there's two diseases with Alzheimer's. There's something called early onset Alzheimer's which is, uh, we have, there are three known genetic mutations that cause it, and this is a disease that um, cannot be prevented. If you carry that genetic mutation, you will develop the disease. There are very few people in the world who have those genetic mutations. And um, in some ways, it's, 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 it's a very good, um, it's very good that we know the, what those genetic mutations are, and we know that that becomes something you can look at to study the other kind of Alzheimer's. But people don't, most people know if they are from a family in which er, there is early onset Alzheimer's because there would be a history that you would know of, of from past generations of people dying from the disease. Um, very few people in the world. Um, what's called late onset Alzheimer's, and what most of us think of as Alzheimer's, um, it can develop in some people in, the 50, in their 50s, more people in their 60s, even more people in their 70s, and most people in their 80s and 90s. So by the time that you get to studying a population of people over 85, 50% of them have Alzheimer's. But they might be at the very beginning of that process at 85. So they might start showing signs of decline, but by the time they're 88, 89, unfortunately, maybe they've died of some other disease, and so they're not dying of Alzheimer's. So um, the, the risk of any one person who, the risk to a person, set this up a different way, if you have a first degree relative who has died of Alzheimer's, if you have a parent or a sibling who's died of Alzheimer's, your risk of developing Alzheimer's is 20%. Now, when I learned that, having had a father who died, when I thought that my risk was great, my, my emotional sense of what my risk of was quite high, suddenly I'm saying, that means I have an 80% chance of not getting it. It's like, knowledge equals power. I feel much better when I learned that. So um, I hope that answers your question. For a healthy America has the issue of cost to address because your dollar can go a lot further from feeding the family if you provide the meals out of the box rather than healthy fresh meats, fruits and vegetables. Has have you guys addressed that? And if so, what what solutions have you come up with? Well, I, you know, Healthy America, we're at the beginning stages, so we're going to really be trying to research by talking to people about what are their obstacles. So before we really decide where we're going to spend the resources. But in the way of the nation, we address, address this, this question. So I've had the opportunity to really study it. First, I want to say that part of the problem is that we've lost cooking skills in this country. So. If people knew how to shop for basic ingredients of whole grains and, and, fresh, and, and vegetables that are store-bought, a lot of frozen vegetables actually have more nutritional value than fresh vegetables because of the way that they're frozen right in the field. And so they're not transported for weeks and stored for weeks. Um, so there's a lot of research that's been done about this consumer issue, that if people had more cooking skills, and we're cooking rice and beans and whole grains, that it actually is cheaper than what's outside, out of the box, ultimately. And, it's, and it's, it can be a very good, healthy diet. So part of our challenge in this country is that we don't cook, and we have now generations of people who don't know how to cook. Um, we also have a problem where the basic ingredients that are in a box that can sit on the shelf, that are non-perishable, that can be in the convenience store for years, and then you take it home and you cook it, and it's a satisfying meal. The only reason it can sit on that shelf for years is because most of the nutritional value that would, you know, if it was the oils that you need in your diet, they would go rancid, okay? If it was the protein, it would spoil. So, what the vast, not the vast majority, what so many people are 
are unfortunately consuming when they're eating out of the box is food that has had taken out of it some of the most important properties. So, but the reason that that food can be in that box and sit on that shelf is that we do have an economic system that has been created over the past century that favors certain commodities like wheat, corn, soy, and what we tried to make the argument for in the way of the nation and what I believe is very important is that we need a rebalancing. You know, we need these commodities to feed a nation this large, to feed the world. We, we can't feed the world without corn and soy and wheat. But we just don't need as much of it. And so we need to support the farmers who really would like to grow fruits and vegetables. Less than 3% of the farmland in this country is devoted to fruits and vegetables. Okay? So that's just an imbalance. And so we need to look at the laws that favor the farmers who are growing these basic commodity crops. They have, and you'll, if you follow the news right now, the farm bill, which comes up every five years, is being debated. It's a hotly contested issue every five years. Um, we've not really had a solid reform of the farm bill for a long, long time. And right now, farmers who grow corn, soy, wheat, cotton, sorghum, rice, they have not only price supports, but they have crop insurance. So they are fully confident as a farmer that if they grow those crops, that their livelihood is protected. Fruits and vegetable farmers, no protections. So you have 10 acres of broccoli, you have a hailstorm, no protection. No bank will give you insurance. No bank will give you a loan because you can't get the insurance. So it's, it's not, we, we have a system that just needs to be re-examined to, to have a better balance. Um, I know there's a lot of other questions, but we only have time for one more question now, and hopefully John will be able to stay around for a few minutes afterwards. So we'll take one last question. Well, um, I'm going to do a documentary about sleep, um, and I tried to think after I did obesity, you know, we all have to eat, so that any, everybody who eats should be interested in, in the weight of the nation. So I tried to think about, well, what's something else that affects all Americans, and we all sleep. Um, and so there's a, a, a real chronic sleep deprivation in America. Um, far too many of us are sleep deprived. Um, far too many people really have genuine trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, the costs to uh, employers is tremendous. Um, the costs on the highways are tremendous. So uh, I think that it is a real need to do for sleep what I, I've done, tried to do for obesity. So that's, that's the next sort of documentary campaign that I'm, I'm doing, so. Well, John, thank you so much. This is another round of